Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Inspiring Leadership Forum. Uh, this is now part of our, our podcast, and we've got together a collection of fascinating CEOs and leaders in their own field. Um, we have, um, I'll introduce you to everybody in good turn, but we have Emma, John, uh, General James Bashel, Mark, Chris, Andrew, Brian, Tom, and Lee, and they'll each be explaining a bit about themselves. The topic today is brand, reputation, image, and impact or what I call BQ uh, on the Inspiring Leadership Compass that Lee and I uh, have done so much work on over the last 20 years. And, and the reason we chose brand is that we deliberately, Lee and I, have selected people that we respect for their brand, their reputation, their image, and their impact, and the way they show up as very inspiring leaders in a very humble, but yet it's almost like what I call the humble alpha, alpha female or alpha male, people with confidence. So we're gonna be talking about this topic and I'd like to begin with uh, Emma Kane, the CEO of Secnugo. Emma, would you perhaps start us off with uh, why this topic is so important and the kind of work that your organization does? Thank you very much. Well, it's a pleasure to join you today. Yes, I'm um, CEO of Secnugate, and we're a global communications firm uh, operating really at the nexus of business, politics, communities, markets, and media. Um, and for corporates and for those leaders of those corporates, brand is, is extremely important. Um, so we, we work with our clients to help them achieve positive outcomes, whether that's uh, seizing an opportunity or solving a specific problem. So um, uh, that's, that's our role. And um, that personal brand for those leaders is very important. I mean, it's estimated being around 40% of the um, value of those businesses and, and, and how they how successfully they perform. Um, so, I mean, one of the key things about personal brand is that it has to be authentic. You can't sustain a brand image for any length of time and, and make it meaningful if it's if it's not not authentic. You get caught out very quickly, mm. um, and and it has to be something that is really uh, sustained and. Uh, you have to be seen in, in across all the different audiences, whether it's the external audiences and the communities in which you're operating um, as, a, as, a, as a business or your own internal stakeholders. And so um, that, that's something to always consider. And it has to be something that you're really passionate about as a, as a leader. But uh, above all, I think that y you, if you focus too much or just on yourself in that personal brand rather than things that other people are interested in and value, um, and again, it falls over. So you have to do a lot of listening as a leader to make sure that um, that, that brand is resonating with people. Fantastic. Thank you, Emma. John, uh, you, you've been CEO of three different companies now. And what for you does this whole topic of brand, reputation, image and impact mean? Perhaps, perhaps at organizational level and then a little bit if you touch on personal level. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, I guess in the, in the companies that I've been in, the, the, the biggest change over the last decade or so is the number of stakeholders to which you, one has to, you know, ensure that the brand resonates. Obviously there's investors, colleagues, customers, suppliers, and you know, within that, you know, the, the added uh, complexity of diversity and now ESG. So making sure that you know, the brand, as I say, keeps moving forward. And as I say, resonates with, with a, a much wider uh, group of stakeholders than probably you know, we used to consider uh, so I think it, it's, it's very complex, and, but the benefits of getting it right, you know, can help you become employer of choice, you know, uh, service of choice, and, uh, you know, really enhance your brand. You think of people like Unilever who have completely transformed them. Hmm. Uh, you know, there are, there are great examples. In fact, I, sorry, I was, I'll, I'll shut up in a minute. I was listening to uh, a show on Radio 4, uh, the other day called The Reunion, and they were talking about Deepwater Horizon and, you know, Tony Haywood's I Wish I Could Get My Life Back. You know? Yes. Oh, That's God. all people kind of remember. And, it, you know, it was just a very difficult situation, uh, you know, for them to manage. You've got to be very careful. Yeah. Beautifully put, beautifully put, John. And, um, yeah, you, you um, have had some fascinating times in different, in different roles, the Bibby Line Group, ITV and a number of other organizations where you've learned so much. 
And now uh, on to Lieutenant General James Bashel. Uh, James now advising top boards, but uh, he was the commander of Home Command and having to represent the British Army abroad in conflict and in peace. So, James, what's, what's your view on this fascinating topic? Well, first of all, I think uh, it's interesting that you use my rank because I think immediately you've got a brand and you've got a perception. Yeah. And and so I don't know what... Uh, good afternoon, everyone, but I'm sorry. I, should have <laughs> but I, I don't know what everyone thinks army people are like but but by using my rank i'm sort of branded already and and i think you've therefore got to deal with uh, in the same way john you know i think what, what i think it was it or channel four you led i mean it's all it's you are assumed to be a certain type of person and i think there's, there's, so that's a sort of the the worry i have about branding perhaps uh in terms of uh, perception i think for, for the military clearly because we are a volunteer military our brand is hugely important in terms of recruiting. And, uh, and without that, then we wouldn't have the attraction that, that young people who come into the military what, would, would have a focus on. But equally, I think you know, we've had to deal with reputation and your brand can sometimes become very toxic and negative, and particularly in the military, which is often in the public eye, for very trivial things in my view, uh, but nonetheless it is, and often in a negative way, you have to deal with the, 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 the misperception about what's going on, but also the, the damage that having a very public brand can do to everyone, including inside the organization, actually, mm. in terms of their own self-belief and worth when it is criticized very publicly at times. Yeah. I thought yeah. leave it there for a moment. Yeah, and, and also perhaps, James, you're also president of the Royal British Legion. Mm. What has is, what is, uh, had to happen there? For, has it adapted over the years itself to, with its brand and what people think it's about? Well, it's, it's very interesting because it's come incredibly topical. So we have just changed our logo uh, at an expense of, I think, about £100,000. And the executive who led the board through the decision was absolutely sound that everything's now digital and therefore we've got to have a, a digital and, and, and I absolutely bought it but many of the members many of the members were very irate that we had wasted money that we could be spending on wounded soldiers on on changing our brand and it, so it is actually quite a toxic issue I, th I think we've moved on from it now and largely people understand it but it, it, it is seen as a waste of money to spend that amount of time um, you know, in danger and bad, but I, I think those like Emma who who lives this world, I think I'm sure would would say that you perhaps you know you have to have a brand that's recognisable and, yeah. and modern, and we have to move with the times. And the Legion is yeah. 100 years old, on the 15th of May this year, and and it has to move on and evolve. And one of the ways it evolves is the way it portrays itself. Yeah, and, yeah. and we, have to, we have to. And like John was saying, you have to reflect the, the 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 character and the nature of the people around you. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, thanks, James. And in fact, you make me smile because uh, when I was in Price Waterhouse Coopers, um, we uh, were going to go independent. The consulting arm had to get broken off from the main accounting practice due to the regulations imposed, and so uh, I, I reckon probably something in the region of two million pounds was spent on the branding and the logo of our new name, and it was revealed in a big reveal to us around the world. And we were going to be called Monday, and we all went, "What yeah. Monday?" Yes, coffee bagels, start of the week. And we went, for the Americans, yes. But for the Brits, like, tell me why I don't like Monday. Manic Monday, ah, oh, not Monday morning. And I don't like starting Monday. And it, it was a real reaction, visceral reaction to it. And of course, that lasted about a year and there was a CEO of Monday and everything. And then IBM bought us and it was all dissolved and we all became part of IBM. So you have to wonder what for. Anyway, James, thank you for that. On, on to uh, Mark, Mark Kleider, the uh, president of Malvern Panelistical. Mark, just tell us a bit about what you do. And also, you've, you've been spending a bit of careful time thinking about what you stand for and your brand and your reputation. I, I found that very interesting when we chatted. Yeah, so uh, Jonathan, thanks for uh, letting me join the forum. And uh, uh, good afternoon, I think, to everybody. I think I might be the only American. And, and you're right, Jonathan, we do love Mondays over here. <laughs> um, yeah, it's interesting. To listen to John. I, John, I like the way you said that about the, um, the the different stakeholders you have to think about relative to your brand. And um, I, I took over Malvern Panalytical a year ago. Tomorrow will be my anniversary. And um, Malvern Panalytical is a is a business that is made up of a number of former businesses. Okay, Malvern is one, and, and Panalytical, the Phillips Analytical, is another. 
and, and it's simply, we make instruments that measure things. We measure materials and that's about as deep as I'll go in what we do. But when I joined the, this business a year ago, what was interesting to me is we had a bunch of different brands inside of our business, but our internal stakeholders, our employees actually resonated with the former brands. So even though we were called Malvern Panalytical, Okay, so my immediate attention became on how do I work on the internal stakeholders, our employees, to really think about coming together underneath a, a new brand. And part of that was really aimed at, at starting to believe in ourselves on what we do, the value we bring to customers. And, and we, we worked on this thing called getting out of the sea of sameness. Because one of the things that became clear to me, if you looked at us versus one of our competitors, websites, terminology, the way we described ourselves, we all sounded the same. And uh, so we, we undertook this initiative, it's called the, um, the Strategy Values and Purpose Initiative. And it came out of an employee engagement survey. And, and over the course of the past year, we've been internally changing our brand. And uh, I was sharing with Jonathan, uh, I guess it was earlier this week, a, a visual that we created that's the world of Malvern Panalytical. And it, it covers everything from who we are, our customers, our stakeholders, uh, Spectrus Group is our owner, um, you know, kind of the technologies, our values, our, our objectives, and created this, this mural, if you will. And we've been using, and it was created by our employees. So James, when you talk about spending a bit of money on something, we spent a bit of money on this, but it was really created with the, uh, with the help of our employees. And uh, what we've been doing is, is rolling it out in these small groups and, and getting people to see how they fit in the world of Malvern Panalytical, and then and then helping tell our story, and uh, it's you know I, I've, I've described this as as this initiative. But when I think of the the brands, and, and and now our employees are starting to think about differently how we brand ourselves to our customers. So going back to John's comment about the the, uh, the stakeholders, and actually John just made me think about something different we need to do um, using the same forum or format. But uh, we've been really focused on the internal brand over the past year to get ourselves all in one team. We've got about 2,300 colleagues spread around the globe that are made up of about nine former companies. And um, so this brand reputation is really, it's important for me internally. So it's where we've been burning a lot of calories over the past year. Great. Thanks, Mark. And, and now I'd like to introduce uh, Chris Pyle. Chris is the, I'd, I'd call him the CEO, but he's the head of the Lancaster Royal Grammar School, which has, I think it's some 500, 700 years old, and was recommended by, Ash, by Brian Ashton, the former uh, England rugby coach, uh, as an inspiring leader. And, uh, and we, we've done a, or we're going to do a podcast together. So I'm looking forward to that. Chris, welcome. Good to have you with the uh, the CEO's Inspiring Leadership Forum. Uh, what's, what's your view on this? Because clearly for a, a school, with a global reputation, uh, it's very important to you. What, what does it mean for you? No, super. Thank you very much for having me. So we're we're, we're officially 549 years old this year, uh, but but we've um, we've dug back in the archives. We think we can nearly make it to 800. So, uh, <laughs> wow. 1235 is the year we're claiming. Um, so yeah, we're a day and boarding school in the northwest of England. I think the I was sort of reflecting on this, and I think the I think one thing that strikes me is I think in the school context we would very rarely use the language of brands. I think there's there's something I think in the way that uh, members of staff would see it, where I think they would they would find brands too uh, too in your face and too straightforward. But what we do talk a lot about is about our reputation and the idea that the reputation rests on. The idea that actually to a parent, a school doesn't have 1,200 pupils, doesn't have 200 borders, but to a parent, uh, a, child, a school is one child wide, one child high. And actually, if the brand is based anywhere, it's based on sort of setting that standard for yourself. I think the interesting challenge for us has been um, that, that we've sort of thought a lot about over the last few years is um, in an institution that's quite old, where there's a long institutional memory, both in the school and in our area. So we've got sort of very strong reputation in the area. Um, is I suppose just trying to deal with the idea that sometimes people's views of you are a generation out of date. And I think we've definitely faced that. So sort of the perception that, you know, I think in the context of the school, we'll meet lots of people who, um, uh, you know, perhaps in the 1980s, it was pretty true if you were very clever or very sporty, 
then the school was a fabulous place to be. And if you weren't in one of those categories, well, perhaps you had a different experience at school. Whereas actually, I think we pride ourselves these days on saying, actually, we're uh, incredibly flexible, very diverse organization. We aren't a one size fits all um, kind of outfit, as it were. And I, sort of things we've worked on there have been to do with long term relationships uh, locally and beyond. So I think it's been about drawing people in and just being very genuine uh, in the relationships we're building. Um, We've done one or two sort of slightly more interesting things. So the school's gone co-educational in part. Uh, we changed some of our admission policies to the school. And, and um, just sort of two brief things from that. I think one has been about establishing a really clear language. So we often talk about saying we want to be the school for every pupil from every street and deliberately trying to shape that. And we use that endlessly uh, with people. Sometimes it doesn't quite go the way we want. So I, mean, I think of one time when um, sort of the, the, the local media had the headline on the, on the front page, I liked it, had the, the headline that said, and it, and it said, we are not an elitist school. Um, so personally, I was delighted with that. That was, that was what I wanted to say, because to me that said, we aren't the isolated school on the hill that never changes, that doesn't listen to people. But actually it was remarkable listening to people's different views of that. And there are other people who read that headline very, very differently. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we've learned one or two things along the way. Brilliant. Chris, lovely. And then uh, our next uh, guest on the series is Andrew Rose. Andrew and I have known each other for some years. I have a lot of respect for you, Andrew, in setting up Sawbell Rose with your partner at a very uh, successful accounting business. Um, and, and you love leadership. You've, all, you've always read widely around this topic. So uh, this is something that means a lot to you. What's, what's your view on this carrying on the conversation so far? Andrew, just on mute, if you just come off mute. Yeah, we're a smaller organisation. Um, we're a partnership. I founded it 26 years ago, and I've been managing partner for 26 years. Um, maybe the time to start thinking about whether somebody else should be taking over. Um, and I've always got, it's a difficult thing with brand. It's a bit like, as you said, uh, James said, I think um, I'm a child accountant, as you can tell by the tie, which I haven't worn. <laughs> and the reason, it's a, it's a strange thing. It part of it goes with the brand. I mean, I haven't been wearing a tie for a year now, um, but um, I had a face-to-face -face meeting and out of respect to my clients, I'm wearing a tie. So it's a strange thing as to whether or not how formal um, you actually make yourself as a child accountant. But I saw in the back of my head, I saw this problem, you see, because I think I can, I can remember John Cleese um, saying, you know, we are the most boring people in the whole world um, and nobody wants to be a chartered accountant. So when I introduced myself or introduced, I'm a chartered accountant, but I'm a bit different to most of the other chartered accountants. So it's getting, it's somehow wanting to benefit from the image of being, you know, trustworthy and uh, rather sort of straight and you can some, you know, trust this with your life and all your money and all your savings. At the same time, being that sort of proactive, you know, active leader if you like in the, for the firm and and said espousing that that actually proactivity is the most important thing and a charter account being proactive is a bit of a you know conundrum so uh, i sort of it, and we're sort of really thinking about our brand at the moment which i've sort of shared with you uh, jonathan whether in fact rather than being the hero and taking the client you know leading them financially down the right route 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 it's more about you know being a guide and being you know somewhere in the background and helping them to be more of a hero. So mm. I'm I'm really looking at it from the point of view of how we do project ourselves. But I, I've had this sort of sceptical view for a long time when branding consultants come in and say you know this this will make you look like this and this that and the other, and I think it's the focus is on the client and the focus is on what we can do for you, um, and uh, rather than what we do ourselves. So. Mm. I'm having this sort of conundrum at the moment, um, how we promote ourselves uh, brand wise um, and at the same time, you know, making sure that it, it comes out authentically mm. and it's somewhat opposite to the, the, the traditional view of accountants. But I do think that COVID has helped us. Um, I you know, make sure every single week we have three meetings, whole firm meetings and we have 45, 50 people every single week and um, they last about 20 minutes, but it is the opportunity of getting our internal values probably more accepted and um, more, more people living them. And us, me being the example that actually, if we espouse the values of being proactive at the same time, being trustworthy and uh, you know, you can put your, your life in our hands as far as your finances are concerned. Um, and reiterating that 
three times a week because we've got everybody's attention, which we couldn't do before when we're all somewhat disparate in different places, actually I think has helped us become more authentic in that way. Um, I don't know, you've, you've worked to this yeah. quite closely, Jonathan. You, you may see us, we weren't like that a couple of years ago, maybe. Yeah. Uh, but I, I am having this sort of viewpoint as we're trying to re rethink ourselves as to whether or not that's actually getting over to our clients. So I think we have a little bit of a problem with actually going against the traditional image of being a chartered accountant at the same time being somebody that actually provides real value to clients. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you for that, Andrew. And then next we have Brian Hayworth, who um, I've known Brian for some years. Brian is the co-managing partner of Lansdowne Partners uh, and also before that had a very successful career at HSBC and both organisations have great brands. Brian, what's your thoughts taking on the, uh, the topic from Andrew? Uh, thanks, Jonathan. And you know, already it's been a, a wonderful discussion. Just a, a couple of quick things. I think um, I, everyone's made great points, but from my perspective, I think um, two things have really stuck out. Um, and again, you can talk about what the brand is of a, an accountant or a school teacher or as an army officer. They're all a damn sight better than a hedge fund manager. So that's probably why you put them last. So um, <laughs> that's something as I've moved from banks to a different part of the industry is very, um, I'm thinking about a lot. I also loved um, Chris's comments about, I tend to think, try and think about reputation rather than brand. I, I do recognize it varies in different industries. I'm sure if you were in advertising or you were advising as Emma is, you know, a retail company, it's a different word. But I think for, I prefer reputation. And I think when you start thinking about reputation behavior, um, both at the individual level and the corporate level, you begin to make some progress. Um, I would say that, yes, I mean, it's interesting, HSBC, big brand, in the world of hedge funds, Lansdowne is a very, very well-established blue chip brand. But the challenge we've got now is that we are no re longer really a traditional hedge fund. We are more a you know, long-term investment manager. So I'm very interested about how leaders take a particular organization and build on the strengths of it. And all the organizations represented here have huge strengths, but also make it evolve and I want to turn Lansdowne into something more client-centric, something a little bit more externally focused, but without losing all the unbelievable stuff that has been created in, in 22 years. And it, it's not 600 years, but in, in our world, 22 years is, is a long time. And then the last point, Jonathan, is again, the caveat here is just my experience in finance. I've seen so many financial organizations and so many individuals completely stuff it up by trying to focus on changing the firm's brand or their individual brand. And they just look ridiculous. You know, bankers trying to be funky, trying to talk about digital enablement when all they're really doing is stopping you, you know, borrowing money. So I think what you have to do, and I'll stop now, is I think, and this is, I'm now just joined this new company. I think you have to trust the people and the process that hired you. Be yourself, be authentic, and worry about clients and reputation and not about brand. So maybe there's a bit of wordsmithing there. Yeah, great. Thank you. And um, thanks for that, Brian. And next I have... Well, I was drinking a Virgin Mary, not a Bloody Mary. I could see <laughs> from my, from my colleagues wondering what I was doing. <laughs> I was time of the day. No, no, I know you didn't drink alcohol. That's very good. And next, Colonel Tom, uh, Tom Solberg. And Tom and I uh, have been chatting recently, and I said, uh, asked him along to, to join us. Um, was very successfully the commanding officer of um, the Commando Engineer Regiment, who went and did uh, helping with a massive disaster relief in the Caribbean and did great stuff there. And now he's um, leading up a team involved in defense strategy, thinking about the future brand and reputation of the whole of defense. So Tom, uh, what's your thoughts on this topic? What comes to mind? Uh, thank you, Jonathan, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, there's been some really interesting in comments so far. And um, I think you know, the, the point General James made about uh, brand for recruiting, I totally 
echo. But also uh, particularly the work we're doing at the minute and uh, in the wake of the integrated review that, that we've just been through is we look at how we support our national security aims in global Britain. We're really focused on that brand, that reputation, you know, the image and the impact that you're you're talking about and how we land that in the minds of our adversaries, our allies and partners around the world. And um, I'll, I'm sure I'll absolutely butcher this, but Eisenhower made the point about um, everything that we say and do or everything that we don't say and don't do sends a message that lands um, overseas. And there's something about how that brand is perceived that allows us to trade on, to, to use, to have that, that influence. Uh, and so it's right at the heart of everything we're doing is we're trying to design strategy and, uh, and um, think about how we take uh, defence forward. Um, I was also really struck by a couple of the points um, that, that people have made. And you know, Brian's point about changing the brand, I thought was really interesting as well. Uh, and the fact that it's often, uh, you know, you say it's really difficult to change a brand and remain authentic. And actually, perhaps what we really need to do is focus on being the very best at that thing that we are, uh, rather than trying to be something that we're not, which moves um, you know, with a trend or, or, or a phase. And also, and Chris mentioned this as well as, as Brian, I think that bit about audience analysis is really important, making sure that we're targeting our thinking and our analysis and our approach of what we say with that, that image in, in order to have impact um, and, uh, and use and build on that reputation. And the only other point I, I, I just thought finally, and you mentioned um, commander engineers in, in the Caribbean disaster relief, um, which is you know, one of the greatest privileges uh, to command that, that group of uh, fantastic soldiers. But um, I found the most powerful brand I've ever had uh, at my disposal was when they owned it. So the soldiers owned the brand of our, our commando tribe, as we referred to it. Uh, and when they built it from the, from the bottom up, it was uh, incredibly powerful and, and really carried us, uh, particularly when we were on operations. Thank yeah. you. Brilliantly put. Lee, Lee Bowman Perks, the CEO of the Inspiring Leadership uh, International and also the Inspiring Leadership Trust, the charity. What was uh, your thoughts, Lee, on? On this topic, well, there's some really beautiful, rich comments, and quite often, actually, as I uh, as I've been listening, I've been hearing wonderful things like our own trust and authenticity, and lots of different triggers that go straight back to the inspiring leadership compass. And I suppose that's what's led us to do the work that we do today. Um, firstly, part of our experiences. So, if I think of maybe working in the airline industry and what what was occurring there, we had these great cultures, and and even despite the act of terrorism or even our own flight disaster, um, it was culture that kept the organization together and that culture was kind of led by the top. So people would talk about the CEOs and the executive team with pride and the organization with pride as well. And, you know, if I take that to the, uh, the finance sector, um, and I won't name which bank I was working in when, when we had the economic breakdown, the, um, the financial meltdown, and it, it's almost like culture imploded in on itself and, and you really felt the shame um, and it seeped through the organization. So whether you went into an organization with great intent to perform, et cetera, you were part of, of a brand. So leading an organization, you, are, you have not just the responsibility for yourself, but the impact of, of your teams around you. And then beyond that, um, and just listening to Tom there about, you know, we, we always talk about words create worlds and whether you're a politician, whether you're a CEO, whether you are in an NGO, no matter what you do, there's a ripple effect, almost like the butterfly effect of, of um, the environment that you create that might not be seen in the here and now today as you manage your own brand and reputation, but it will certainly be felt in the ripple effect of a, you know the butterfly effect. And I think that's something that maybe you know, write, writing the book on inspiring leadership and the toxic turnarounds. I'm always looking at this dark side, light side at the moment, but there is that element of actually, how do we start to address things for the long term and not just actually be um, in this mode of self-preservation for today. And the more that we see inspiring leaders and inspiring organizations role modeling that, but um, that the better we'll be. And inspiring leadership for us, you know, when we were 
delivering that in organizations, I think what was so powerful then was to set up a charity and to answer, to practice what we preach um, um, uh, and put our words into action. So turning um, the work that we do and bringing it out to people that really need it, it's almost like how can we affect change for the future where it's most needed within our sphere of influence and then taking accountability for that, stepping into the arena, taking ownership and saying, we've got to be part of something um, that affects change change for the, 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 the kind of the broader piece. Um, but some beautiful stuff around, uh, I've heard some lovely quotes today, but Brian, the mistakes, um, you said take, uh, you were talking about uh, um, kind of challenges and mistakes and things like that. And, it uh, made me think of, um, is it Benjamin Franklin? And it takes great deeds or some to build a, a reputation, but only one bad deed to, to, to completely lose it. Um, and especially in this day and age, uh, reputations are very fragile. And what does that mean in terms of actually how exposed and vulnerable we feel and therefore um, how we might hold ourselves back or when we do wrong, the implications of that as well. So. Um, but some really great stuff. Yeah, Lee, beautifully put. And you were saying to me earlier, and I love that quote, um, you, you are the average of the five people you spend your most time with. So choose the people around you wisely. I'm just going to say a few bits and pieces, then I'm going to ask us to go around the, uh, the group again. But beginning with Emma, I've really just perhaps talking about um, where you've seen someone get their brand of themselves or their organization badly wrong. You don't have to name names. Uh, I think it's, it's quite fun just to hear where, where, not fun, but it's just a lesson to us all, hear when people have got it wrong on their own personal brand and, and it's not a healthy one or that of their organization. And then when you've known people that you want to call out who you think have actually got a good brand, someone you respect and inspire. And indeed, why I'm, uh, Lee and I are with nearly all of you, it's because somebody else recommended you as an inspiring leader. And I think this is the thing about brand and, and as as Brian said, reputation, image, impact, uh, is that um, who, who are the people who would refer you? Uh, and when you're gonna go and meet someone, you often ask somebody else, what is she like? What is he like? And, and you'll get this soundbite of what they're like. Oh, they, you know, they're really nice and warm and friendly and very interested in you, or they're a complete dragon, or he's a bully or whatever it might be. And it's quite hard to shake that, that off, that people have this image of you. And so also, I think all of you, I know from speaking to you personally, are mentors, are coaches to other people. And you have an alumni of people that you, you've touched, this idea of the starfish on the beach. Um, and and if, you, if you wonder about the impact you could have, there's that story, probably in a Caribbean country, Tom, maybe where you're doing disaster relief and all the starfish are washed up on the beach. And you're walking along this beautiful scene, but after the devastation of the storm, and, and you see all these starfish drying out and dying on the beach. And you see this little wizened old lady coming towards you and she's doing so, you can't work out what she's doing. And she's stooping down and doing something and you get closer and you see her picking up a starfish and throwing it back in the sea. And you're going, what are you doing? There's thousands of them, they're, they're all dying. It's, it's, it's pointless, give up, you know, just stop doing this. She said, no, but hang on. And she throws out another one. She said, I made a difference to that one. And, and, and I just want you all to remember, and all those who are listening, that you can, as a mentor, as, a, as an inspirational leader, with your own brand repetition and how you're showing up, make a huge difference. That lovely line, and again, it was a teacher, Chris, who um, got a junior teacher in and said to her, she said, remember the pupils, they're learning you. They're not learning what you say, but they're learning you how you're behaving and, and how you're being. And I, I do think that's really important. So what are you like? What do people say that you're like, or this other person? Uh, and then we've got things like Glassdoor, where you look at organizations like Remitly with some of you met Matt uh, Oppenheimer, you know, 98% rating of him as a CEO of that organization and that they would follow him anyway. And, and for those who were in the forces, you know, certain leaders we would follow to war, literally, you would go and die following that guy. Others, you would follow out of curiosity, wondering what they were gonna mess up next or where they were gonna get you lost. So I, I just think, think about your own reputation, what it is. So if we carry on round, Emma, what, what's been sort of some of the worst cases and perhaps some disaster stories you could warn us of, and then some of the good ones that you want to personally name who got their uh -huh. reputation right? 
I haven't, I'm not, not prepared to talk about, um, you know, the, the worst ones. And actually I have a sort of brain that only remembers positive things. So um, <laughs> I don't have to think about that more. But in terms of some of the interesting things about about personal brand and and I, and I agree with um with john that there's there's a there's a difference between um brands and and reputations and so on i think that on, on the personal brand i've always found it fascinating that uh, angela merkel actually has a stylist um and and that is her personal brand is just to look always to look exactly the same um, as just as Steve Jobs did, if you look at him over the the, um, the years, um, so that people aren't focused on what, she, in Angela Merkel's case, what she's wearing, it's what she's saying. Um, and, and I think that that's fascinating. Um, it's Sheryl Sandberg who, who says that, that individuals don't have brands, that's the sort of um, the area for the periers and, and, and so on, that they have brands, but it's about reputation. And um, and I think that the, the the reason that reputation is so important as a leader is because of that that whole thing about trust, and um, as people have mentioned in terms of people believing their career is safe with them, and so particularly during this whole last year, the um, the leaders who've hidden behind emails as opposed to being out there and making sort of. Um, uh, videos or holding webinars or whatever to to address the their their um, all their different stakeholders. You know that's a very different relationship you have, and you trust those people that actually what what's being said. Whilst all your your colleagues or flatmates or whatever are losing their jobs, that you trust your leader when they say your your job and your career is is safe. So I so I think that's um, that's um, interesting. I think the people who get it right are the people who listen and don't just presume they're getting it right. So always checking on the way that um, what you think you're doing is actually what people are hearing because we know perceptions are everything um, and um, and then uh, and, and then making changes as you go along I mean there's a there's a golden rule in life of never ask a question you don't want to hear the answer to but if, as long as you do want to hear the answer and you are keen to improve as a leader then that's that's really important brilliant thanks Emma Joel what's uh, what's your build on perhaps uh, where people have got it wrong and then when you've also respected someone for getting it right? Um, well, I worked for a company called Arkiva, which renamed itself Arkiva. Um, and when I started, I uh, did all my due diligence and, and we were going through all our big customers. We had, and the government was a very large customer. So I, I was speaking to someone uh, in central government and I said well what's your view of Arkiva and they said well a we've never heard of you and those of us who have heard it can't spell it um, because it <laughs> it misses the u after the q and and he said so many you know and so that was it was a nonsense it was a complete nonsense because so many emails went missing because people you know got it wrong and and I just you kind of wonder how you get there um Look, I've worked in ITV. I had a chairman who was famous for wearing braces and red socks. Um, I have. A, I worked for another chairman, kind of building on uh, Emma's story about Angela Merkel. And I, I would, I can tell what he was. What he, if he was on this call now, he would be in a black or midnight blue suit, a white shirt, and a dark blue tie. That's all I've ever seen him wear, and that is his his brand. Now, make, you know, obviously, it makes it easier. Uh, to get dressed, but I, I the um, I, I first really was kind of impacted by by brand in two ways. One is I, I, uh, I qualified as a chartered accountant as well, and I was very fortunate that I had a a holiday job in a gentleman's outfitters. So when I started work, I looked I looked like an accountant. I had a stripy suit, a stripy shirt and tie, and you know it really helped because people. Thought I was an accountant because I looked looked like one, and so style over substance kind of uh, won out. The other one is uh, when the deregulation of the financial uh, services uh, happened in the early, I think it was the early nineties. And I remember opening the Financial Times, and there was a very big accountancy firm. There's a map of the UK, and they had all these dots on it. And the strap line was, I won't tell you which firm it was. <laughs> Our advice is all over the place. And I, <laughs> I can't quite believe 
Yeah, and, and you know, we, we used to see you know, a lot of marketing and, and, and advertising brands through ITV, and you, some some of them you think, how does this ever ever get through? But you know, <laughs> and, and you you know, you can get it wrong. A person, you know, sometimes people get it wrong individually as well. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. James, what about you? What's um, what's your take on from that? Well, I, I just thought I'd develop the idea of the brand as a psychological tool and as a psychological hindrance and I I would obviously I'm afraid use my own examples of my own life in the military but I as you know I served in the parachute regiment for most of my time and the parachute regiment has a reputation and like it or not that that's what we have uh, we can we can find two aspects of it but particularly going overseas on operations there are times when you want to accentuate your brand and for, to, to, for people to really realize and think about who you are and, and be you know, perhaps cautious around you. And there are times when it worked against us. And we had, I was always trying to defend and protect my brand because we were considered lacking in sensitivity to deal with certain situations. Uh, and so I think understanding the psychological, for me, understanding the psychological impact that particularly the population in, a, in an overseas operation has or can have on you as your brand, I think it's been really important to me. So I've learned. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm afraid, you know, that sometimes we got it wrong, um, but mostly I think we probably got it right. Yeah, very good. Thank you, James. Mark, what's your freshest thinking from this uh, this topic, brand, reputation, trust? I think, I guess from my perspective, just kind of tying it back to leadership and having worked for a number of different uh, um, leaders in my career, some extremely inspiring and some completely demotivating. But what always struck me or what strikes me is um, when somebody's words don't match their actions, and they don't get it. Okay, yeah. so they actually think that uh, that they've got this great brand, but uh, what they say versus what they do are two different things. And um, yeah, to, at least for me personally, and, and Jonathan, as you've got to know me, I'm I'm a self-described servant leader, right? Yeah. And it's it's refreshing to hear, and a lot of that is anchored in my faith. But it, it's great to as I as I communicate that down through my organization. And have that come back from people really appreciate that we recognize that we see that yeah that that sort of that confirmation that that as i see myself it's landing in the group and if i'm not hearing that back i'm going to search why but uh, yeah i love i love seeing people that uh, have great words but their actions are completely out of phase with those words that's yeah that's yeah yeah too many of those thank you for that mark chris what's your freshest thinking of, of the good and the bad um i suppose i was just reflecting that um, sometimes complaints and problems can actually end up having a positive effect. So I think the one of the difficult things in leadership is trying to work out which complaints and problems are, are, are controllable and um, which ones have the potential to cause massive damage. But I think one thing that I have been very struck by over the years, years is that sometimes the individual who comes because from their perspective something's gone badly wrong, actually the way you respond to their complaint and their problem can actually have the most beneficial effects. So I think sometimes kind of the conflict, I suppose in the broadest sense, can sort of expand the set of possible solutions. You know, you've understood your organization better because you've understood the way that um, people experience it. But I think more to the point, I think there's just so much of it is, as people have said, is about trust, relationships, people understanding that uh, when a problem comes to you, if you say you'll sort it out and you do, then actually, sort of paradoxically, you can strengthen the relationship so that actually, in a, in a funny way, the, sort of from my perspective, the parent who came and complained, but has then been dealt with properly uh, and has had those promises sort of amply fulfilled, will actually go away as, as a more satisfied customer than the parent who never had the complaint in the first place. So, so sort of to me, I've definitely seen that, but, but, but it's a stressful place to be because mm. as you go through it, it's very difficult to have that perspective. It's only afterwards that sometimes you, you, you come away and think, oh, no, actually, no, not only did we learn from it, uh, but actually we know them better. We understand their perspective better as well. Yeah, lovely put, Chris. Thank you. Andrew, what's, what's your first thinking of the good and the bad? Um, <clears throat> I'll remember not to mention our advice is all over the place. <laughs> the warning, because um, accountants aren't known for understanding people very well. Um, I mean, to me, um, this question of inspiring leadership and um, brand go quite closely together. And I, I absolutely believe in Chris, it's like when there's a complaint, 
And I always say to people, you actually only know what people are really like when they're at the edges. Um, you know, if you've got a client that goes kaput, what does he actually do in those situations? Does he put other people first or just himself first? So I'm always interested to know what people are really like. And I don't think you really find out, and I'm sure in battle it's the same, um, until you're actually on the edge. Um, so I think that's a very good test. I mean, I, I also relish complaints because then I've got the opportunity to win them right. And, and, the, and I think we end up enhance our brand as a result of that. To me, I think actually COVID was a, a great opportunity to show that we care. And I think caring is part of the brand, not just trustworthiness, but you truly care like the lady who's throwing back the starfish in the water and putting, you know, putting caring above profitability and showing it because we're the money people and actually not charging, you know, that time, just being there for the clients probably enhanced our brand more than the else we could have done. Um, so to me, I, I, I like it when it's at the edge and I think it, that shows up what we really like and then making, so making our own people in terms of, to me, as my leadership is making our own people the hero. So giving credit, not taking credit for it, but being generous with credit, both to our own people internally, but also to our clients, you know, they've done a fantastic job. We don't need to say that we've, you know, we've actually helped them do it, but um, to me, that enhances the brand of, of, of caring and being, if you like, a guide as well. Yeah, that's great. Before I go into Brian, when Brian and Tom and Lee have been, we'll just do a final um, 20 seconds each with a, a sort of almost like your final bit of advice about anything on brand, reputation, image, impact, a, a tip, your sort of top tip to people. So you might want to think and reflect on that just to give you time to think of that. So Brian, what's, uh, what's your freshest thinking on this topic? Uh, three quick things. And I'm you know, pretty new to this sort of CEO gig. Um, so I've learned a lot, three things. One is this point about reputation. You tend to think of careers or company as sort of sequential, um, but a lot of a company or individual's reputation is based on behaviors and actions from 10, 15, 20 years ago. So I think you tend to be asking people about their last two or three years or their last job to actually really understand behavior and the essence of the man or woman. I think you need to look over the, the, you know, the whole career. So I think that's something that I have hadn't really thought about as much as I should have done. I love this idea about um, that James made about understanding what your brand is and without being too sort of Machiavellian, if you understand the brand and are self-aware individually as an organization, you can then um, probably um, help people more than your tone deaf about it. And then the last point, I, I love this last point about um, looking for problems and then solving them. I spent 30 years in three banks, wheeled out endless senior executives. None of them wanted to hear problems from clients. I almost used to sort of definitely sort of prep things so it would go smoothly. And I think one thing I'm committed to is doing the opposite, which is when you go and see clients or stakeholders, find out what the problems are and then um, try and solve them. But that is a big, big change. It would be necessary across finance, given the egos of most people involved. Very, very interesting. Yeah, I, I so like that. Tom, what's your, uh, your final thoughts on this one, good and bad? Um, I think uh, on the bad point, I've seen a couple of uh, occasions when leadership has got the brand wrong and I build on the point that John James and, and Brian made about leaders who just don't understand their brand and equally don't understand the people within their organization uh, and, and on you know there are two occasions and I won't single them out specifically but where the leader has failed to understand those uh, the organization has suffered and their reputation has suffered um, and they've not understood the outputs they were driving towards and what their, their real purpose and what their people uh, were after um, and then I'd also pick up on on Mark's point and something somewhere that gets uh, its brand really uh it really clearly articulated and really well delivered and, and that's um the, the royal military academy at santos which we use as a world leader in brand um and it picks up on that servant leader point with the very motto being serve to lead and goes back to this that, that key facet of leadership uh, and, and servant leaders uh, and i think that brand works really really well yeah great thank you lee what's your your thoughts um, so uh, I just think it's there's something I'll go back to what Emma was saying earlier about authenticity um, and the courage to be authentic um, and the embracing of difference. So not only in yourself, 
and I think when I've got it severely wrong, um, and I know this, I've got a dark side, um, which is around how I compare myself to other people. Um, and there's a whole kind of set of baggage that now in my earlier days, I really struggled with that. I was comparing myself to people that were really high performers around me and thinking, I'm never good enough. I'm never good enough to be in the room. And within that, I think there was some de brand depletion because whilst I was so focused on what I wasn't, I was less focused on what I could be. So and that's an internal kind of turmoil that I think so many people and particularly um, women go through. So I'm just, I'm going to own it and share it actually as one of those vulnerable places that I've been in my career. Um, because as soon as I get over that huge hurdle, then I could walk on stage and speak. I could show up in meetings and, and hold the room. I could inspire people. But I had to get over my own dark side, first of all. Mm. So, um, so authenticity is really important to that. Um, journey because actually we're all so different that we can't be a second rate version of somebody else we have to be a first rate version of ourselves and when we can own that I don't know who the quote was by but um, then then we are in our full power um, and there's a place for all of us but through that very nature of authenticity is really understanding and not just talking about diversity but how do we then embrace authenticity in others by being truly diverse and inclusive in the way that we work together. Um, and that is, I think, enhancing our brands as well, because you are innovating, you're collaborating, you are um, culturally sensitive, all of those wonderful things. Um, and so I'm going to stop there because I think I've had my thumbs up for a time's up. <laughs> yeah, that's great. No, thank you, Lee. And I think it was Isadora Duncan said that quote that you had. And thinking of quotes, um, if, if we each have a quote to each or a top tip, uh, whether you agree with this or not, my, mine is you're only as good as your last job, your last gig. Uh, you've got to you've got to keep going and improving and enhancing. You're the um, the imperfect leader leading a perfect team. Emma, what's your uh, what's your quote on brand reputation and trust? I think understand your purpose and focus because you can't be everything to everyone and across it you know, so just know what, what your particular superpower is I guess and, yeah. and that brilliant lovely John what's yours uh feedback is the breakfast of champions oh I love it yes that's great be yourself, be yourself and be consistent yeah James I think you've got to own it as the leader you've got to you've got to have responsibility for it when that's the lesson I've learned from the Royal British Legion changing their brand brand you've got to yeah yeah brilliant Thank you. Mark, what's your, what's your tip? Yeah, mine, mine's around uh, legacy. As leaders, <clears throat> everybody wants to leave a legacy and, and everybody thinks it has to be something big, but all of us have an opportunity every day to leave small legacies. And it might be just ringing up somebody, saying hello, acknowledging a piece of work or, or something big, donating your time. But I think, I think you can move people's worlds by just touching people in small ways. So that's, that's what I think about from a legacy perspective. That's lovely. We're going to do a session on legacy. Um, not next week. We're going to uh, uh, move that to a later, a later. They're all going to be videos sessions once a month from here on in. Chris, what was your tip or your quote? Uh, just very struck by Tom a second ago saying that <clears> the <throat> motto of Sandhurst is serve to lead. So the motto of my school is lead in order to serve. And um, which I, th I think really means the same thing, but just like in a mirror, I think. I think the, but, but actually, I think that is such a powerful message, isn't it? That I think the danger is that we begin to believe it's about us, but actually it isn't. It's about our audience, our customer, our pupil, the people that we're serving. I think if we lose focus on that, we're sunk. Yeah, great, great, Chris. Andrew, what's your uh, tip, your quote? Um, it's just a simple one, really. And it's something that I think professionals don't always do. Do what you say you're going to do when you say you're going to do it. Um, because that's all, when you don't do that, it exposes you to being, you know, not completely authentic or congruent. So uh, it's simple, but it's the one I probably espouse most often to the rest of my team. Lovely. Thank you for that. Brian. I'm going to steal a comment from Andrew, which is to go looking for problems and try and solve them. Yeah, I, I'm going to remember that one too. Thank you. Tom, what's yours? Uh, I'm going to have to re-echo the, the point on authentic leadership, uh, being yourself and owning it. And I think our people respond to actions and behaviours more than words. And if you don't own it and own your leadership style, your brand will suffer. Yeah, 
Lovely. And Lee, will you wrap us up and then we'll uh, go off record and we'll have a quick chat before everybody splits for the weekend? Uh, just that nobody can build a reputation on empty promises. You've got to deliver and make an impact. That's fantastic. Lee, thank you. And, and everybody, thank you for being on the uh, Inspiring Leadership uh, Forum. It's been great having all the CEOs and the leaders together. And we look forward to our next session on the 21st of May and the 18th of June when we're going to be recording again. Stay on. We'll just finish the recording, but thank you all for your contribution.